Okay, well, good morning, everyone. I'm Rob Atkinson. I'm president of the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, a think tank in Washington. And uh, at, at ITIF, we're quite involved in, in pushing for and helping to support um, the whole process of passing the CHIPS Act. And uh, one of the key things about the CHIPS Act and, is, is that it's a little bit of an unprecedented public, pro sorry, federal state partnership. And if it's going to work effectively, uh, the states have to play a key role, which they are, but we don't really hear a lot about the state role here in Washington. And so we put together this really great panel this morning to hear from three state leaders uh, and three leading states uh, about how they're going about trying to attract and grow their semiconductor industry. Um, and so let me start off by introducing each of our speakers in the order that we're going to hear from them. Uh, First is Sandra Watson. Sandra is president and CEO of the Arizona Commerce Authority, which is essentially is the state, uh, the state's economic development body. She oversees the Workforce Arizona Council and the Arizona Office of Economic Opportunity. And she also serves as senior economic policy advisor for uh, Governor Katie Hobbs. Um, she also, with me, <laughs> is a member of the uh, State Science and Technology Institute Board, SSTI, Kevin Yunus is the Chief Operating Officer and Executive Deputy Commissioner of the Empire State Development, uh, which is, a, the again, the economic development arm for the state of New York. He has over 25 years experience in economic development policy. He was involved heavily in the New York Green Ships Act uh, and the creation of the Semiconductor Incentive Program there. Adriana Cruz is the Executive Director of Economic Development and Tourism for the Governor, uh, Office of Governor Greg Abbott. Uh, she provides leadership to business and community development, Texas Tourism, the Workforce Investment Council, and others. Uh, she was a former uh, president of the Greater San Marcos Partnership. Wes Hambrick is her colleague. Wes is Federal Affairs Director, Office of Governor Greg Abbott, in, again in Texas. Uh, we wanted to bring in the private sector's uh, uh, role in this or voice in this, because obviously that's uh, they are the ones that are ultimately are putting up most of the money and taking most of the risks here. So we're really pleased to have David Isaacs with us. David is the vice president of government affairs for the Semiconductor Industry Association. Uh, and David really was played a critical role in, in, in advancing and, and helping uh, shape uh, the CHIPS Act. So. Uh, uh, and, and now as it's being implemented following it. Uh, finally, uh, Rachel Lipson. Rachel is a senior policy advisor to the CHIPS program office. For those of you who don't know, this is the office in NIST that is uh, charged with overseeing the implementation of the program office, particularly the uh, incentive grants. Um, she uh, focuses on regional industry clusters, workforce and economic development. And she was uh, formerly a co-founder and director of Harvard's Project on Workforce and had been at the World Bank and the J.P. Morgan Chase Foundation. So just a um, quick word before we start. Uh, as I noted before, the states have really been doing economic development since the 1930s uh, when Mississippi started uh, a program. And especially in the 70s and 80s with deindustrialization, you have virtually every state now that has an economic development office and most have a technology office where the governor uh, has charged them with growing their technology based economic uh, their, their technology based economies. And this is really important because if we're going to win the China technology challenge, as well as broader economic competitiveness challenges, it, we have to do this in, in partnership with the states. Uh, we're too big a country to be able to manage these kinds of relationships with firms, universities, unions, uh, community colleges, uh, local governments, et cetera. Uh, you know, a country like Estonia might be able to do that or Sweden or Finland, but, but we're too big for that. And so we have to have states that know the, the, the actual operation and, and, and on the ground, if you will, in, in how their regional economies work. Uh, last point I'll make before we uh, turn it over uh, to uh, to Sandra and, and the speakers is uh, this is not really about commercials for for states and uh, all all three states, uh, which is why we asked them to join us, are leading semiconductor production states and and doing a lot there. So we're really going to talk today m much more about what is the role of the states, what are e each state doing to help make the Chips Act, 
act a success and what are some of the things that uh, we all need to get right uh, from the state and national level. Uh, so with that, uh, over to Sandra. Thanks so much, Rob. I appreciate it. And thanks so much for including me in this important discussion today. Um, I've got some slides. Great. Thank you. Um, so I'll just begin by um, talking a little bit about what we've been doing here in Arizona and how the work that we're doing here in Arizona complements the CHIPS Act and working very closely with the federal government and our peers from across the country. Um, next slide, please. So when we started this discussion, as we all know, this conversation around the CHIPS Act uh, was discussed across the nation with our congressional leaders and the White House for several years before its passage. So in October of 2021, we convened uh, the first meeting of the National Semiconductor Economic Roadmap Committee. We brought together industry leaders from across the country. They didn't necessarily have to be companies here in Arizona, but we felt that with the discussion around the CHIPS Act, that we really needed to understand what other issues outside of funding were required to ensure that the U.S. really maintained a leadership position, not only in the production of chips, but research and development as well. So in October of 2021, we convened the very first meeting with over 80 participants. We included other states in that. We had several states participate along with universities. But the driver of the semiconductor economic roadmap was really industry their participation, bringing them together so that we could better understand as states what their issues were. In addition to obviously convening the industry partners and leaders throughout um, the US, we also worked very, very closely with SIA and the SEMI uh, Foundation to ensure that we were capturing all of the important um, gaps that we needed as states to focus on developing recommend recommendations so that ultimately we could help support the work that was ha um, happening at the federal level. So we convened uh, several uh, different groups. We had committees. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, in August of 2022, once the CHIPS Act passed, we launched our Arizona Semiconductor Task Force. This was specific to Arizona to support um, efforts around the CHIPS Act and to ensure that our companies here in Arizona had what they needed in order to not only apply for those funding uh, opportunities, but also look at those research uh, grant opportunities as well and how we might come together and apply for those in the future. In November of 2022, um, Arizona invested $100 million to enhance the statewide semiconductor ecosystem. That's actually a historic investment here in Arizona. We're very excited to administer and manage those funds. And we were able to work closely with our university and industry partners, and we're still developing uh, some opportunities within the, uh, the program. In December of 2022, um, we, launched the semiconductor, the National Semiconductor Economic Roadmap. So after about 18 months of meetings with private industry, um, they formed committees and we launched the roadmap and that roadmap is available. Uh, we provided it to the CHIPS office as well as to um, several of our partners across the country to ensure that we're all focused on the key issues that are essential to building the competitiveness of the semiconductor industry here in, in the US. The four areas of focus were workforce, the supply chain, opportunities, infrastructure, and entrepreneurship. In January, 2023, um, Semicon annou uh, West announced an annual rotation of its conference in Phoenix. So we're very excited about the opportunity to host them uh, this next coming year and uh, we look forward to working with them very closely. In March of 2023, we decided that we would uh, stay very focused on um, ensuring that not only are we focused on building an ecosystem that supports the established and leading semiconductor industry players, but we also wanted to ensure that we were connecting our entrepreneurs to this um, incredible opportunity. So we launched a partnership with Plug and Play, and we created a new office here in Arizona focused on advanced manufacturing 
in June of 2023, we launched the first two of six new advanced manufacturing training centers designed specifically to work with industry partners to ensure that they've got the talent and workforce that they need. And then um, just last month, as many of you may um, have read, we announced a partnership with Applied Materials ASU on a $270 million materials to fab center, which is extremely exciting uh, for us here in Arizona. Next slide, please. Just to just give you a little, a little more information on some of the activity, the Arizona Semiconductor Task Force, as I said, we launched in 2022. We have over 80 uh, stakeholders from industry, academia, workforce development, the public sector, all coming together. We've, we've already had five full task force meetings. We've broken up into subgroups and we have convened four of those subgroup meetings today, of course, covering the important areas for the industry to ensure, again, that we're complementing the efforts of the CHIPS Act, and we're looking at opportunities to enhance workforce, also applied uh, 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 with our Applied Materials uh, Manufacturing Center. We're also looking at advanced packaging in, in several other areas. Next slide, please. With $100 million, we've uh, made the $30 million investment in the Materials to Fab Center. We also have some additional announcements that we're getting ready to make with other university partners. The $100 million was really designed to enhance the ecosystem here in Arizona, and it's working very closely with the universities. The intent of the $100 million is really focused on how to improve our research capacity at our three universities to support the industry. Next slide, please. The uh, National Semiconductor Economic Roadmap, just again to highlight some of the important factors in this roadmap. It was designed to complement the CHIPS Act as the CHIPS Act was being negotiated at the federal level. Um, we started working to ensure that while that funding was available, the key areas for the industry to thrive in the U.S. was really designed around workforce and how do we prepare um, the next generation of talent to ensure that the semiconductor industry has the talent they need for this robust and uh, increased growth that we're seeing here in the U.S. Supply chain. Um, Obviously, we saw some of the challenges in the supply chain during the COVID uh, and, and the pandemic. It was really important that we brought together industry leaders to determine whether or not we have the supply chain uh, in place in order to support the industry. Infrastructure really focuses on R&D um, and the assets that we have for the production and research of the um, next generation chip manufacturing and then entrepreneurship creating uh, opportunities for entrepreneurs to access capital. As you know, there's a lot of barriers to entry for the entrepreneurial community in this industry because it's so capital intensive and we felt it was necessary to really focus on innovators and, and develop programs to ensure that they're connected into this exciting opportunity. Next slide, please. Um, this is just a quick example of one of our uh, workforce accelerators. I won't go into it too much other than we've designed accelerators to ensure that we've got education and academia working closely with the private sector and the public sector to ensure we're producing the talent necessary. This particular center was created in 2021. It was designed around advanced manufacturing. In the first year, we had over 2,000 students enrolled who actually graduated from this program. So again, continuing to build that talent pipeline. Next slide, please. World-class education. I think we're all gonna brag about our universities and the important role that they play here at Arizona. We've got three public universities. We have several private uh, universities and a, a community college system. In total, we have 122 total universities and colleges with over 490 plus thousand students. And we also have 222 schools offering career and technical education, which is absolutely critical to advancing the talent needs of the semiconductor industry. One of the key areas that I'd uh, like to focus on is that the ASU has continued to expand its engineering 
uh, program, and we have over 30,000 students um, registered in engineering just at ASU in the fall of 2022. That's 160% increase. We've got several things happening at our, our other universities, and we're very excited about the collaboration within the university system with private sector and public sector working together. Next slide, please. The Talent Pipeline, just to add a, a little bit of color here, there's a few programs that were established. The Semiconductor Technician Quick Start Program is a 10-day program designed to prepare students. Uh, we have an advanced technology network, again, bringing industry together with our community colleges and then the career and technical education districts. We have over 17,000 students enrolled in that program alone. Next slide. Sandra, if you could wrap up quickly, yes. that would be great. This is my last slide, thank you. And this is um, an important slide for us. We have launched Future 48, which is designed to uh, continue our efforts around Drive 48, which is those workforce accelerators. We've just announced two. Uh, we've got four more that we're announcing, and one will be specifically designed to enhance semiconductors and working very close with industry. So I'll hand that back over to you, Rob, and thanks so much for including me. Sandra, thank you so much. Again, really great example of why states are so critical to this because you're right on the ground there with the ecosystems and, and all the institutions and the companies. So, uh, Kevin, over to you uh, hear about what New York State is doing. All right. Thanks, Rob. Uh, thanks to IDF for, uh, for organizing this important discussion. Uh, good morning. My name is Kevin Yunus. I'm the CEO of New York State's economic development entity, Empire State Development. Uh, ESD is charged with growing New York's economy and supporting the drivers of prosperous local economies across the state. I'm here representing Governor, Ho Governor Kathy Hochul and ESD Commissioner Hope Knight. Uh, I'd like to thank the other panelists in today's discussion, and we'll be sure to steal any of your great ideas. Uh, honored to be here with them to discuss this work uh, that has such incredible implications for not only New York, but for our entire nation. Uh, we're excited to talk about what New York is doing and has done that will help the CHIPS Act succeed. Uh, New York has been investing in the semiconductor ecosystem for decades, and Governor Hochul has made the industry a key focus of our administration since day one. Within a year of taking office, she created a $10 billion semiconductor incentive program, secured Micron's historic commitment to build in New York, and launched the Governor's Office of Semiconductor Expansion Management and, and Integration, which is an office created to lead and centralize all the work being done to grow this industry in New York. Uh, we believe that New York will continue to grow the semiconductor industry and help ensure the CHIPS Act success for a few important reasons. We have a highly educated workforce, excellent network of technical colleges and universities, and a strong and growing semiconductor ecosystem. New York has world-class R&D assets, including the multi-billion dollar Albany Nanotech Complex, the most advanced publicly owned 300 millimeter semiconductor R&D facility in the world. And New York has robust economic development tools that were designed to reduce the cost differences with Asia that have driven semiconductor manufacturing offshore, as well as supporting critical investments in workers and sustainability. We built the infrastructure, including low cost, reliable power and plentiful water capacity, as well as invested in hundreds of millions of dollars to develop shovel ready sites for the semiconductor industry. And we're home to an extensive industry that includes many of the world's leading semiconductor companies, including IBM, Global Foundries, Wolfspeed, OnSemi, Applied Materials, Tokyo Electron, and more. Uh, and we have great quality of life. From great schools to an incredible built environment to its incredible natural assets, New York is really a great place to live. I first like to talk a bit more about workforce. While New York has a highly educated and robust workforce that is primed to meet the needs of the semiconductor industry, we rank first in the Northeast in STEM graduates and third nationally in high-tech workforce. New York is home to more than 170 colleges and universities, and it is the only state in the nation with two Ivy League universities. And New York is home to the nation's largest public university system, the State University of New York, with 64 institutions. We've also created the Office of Strategic Workforce Development, which has a focus on growing the manufacturing and technology workforce in New York, including the semiconductor industry. In its first year, the office has awarded over $24 million to 39 projects intended to train over 9,000 workers. 
And we've also prioritized investment in semiconductor research and development for decades. New York is ranked second in the U.S. in both semiconductor patents and total annual economic academic research and development expenditures at $7 billion annually. The Albany Nanotech Complex, owned and operated by New York Creates in Albany, New York, is the world's only 300 millimeter open access semiconductor R&D facility and was used to pattern the first seven nanometer, five nanometer, and three nanometer chips. Albany Nanotech has hosted to thousands of research and billions of dollars in public and private investment. This complex remains one of the world's most advanced semiconductor research facilities and is, is poised for continued expansion. We've also created incentives targeted specifically to the semiconductor industry. Green chips is the key tool that the governor and the state legislature authorized to incentivize the growth of semiconductors in New York. Passed before the Federal Chips Act, it aligns with the federal program, which is not an accident. Green chips was designed to work in tandem with the federal program. The program provides for up to 10 billion in refundable tax credits for semiconductor projects that create at least 500 jobs and make at least 3 billion in capital investments. It provides substantial refundable tax credits for qualified capital expenses, R&D spending, and wages. And the program also requires and supports worker and community investments as well as sustainability commitments. And we work closely with our partners to help connect the companies to the resources they need to enable them to meet their commitments. New York has some of the most stable and abundant energy and natural resources in the country, including water and electricity, making it a very attractive place to locate chip fabs. We're in the forefront of investing in renewable energy generation and transmission and expect to achieve 100% carbon-free electricity statewide by 2040. Access to renewables, fresh water sources, including two Great Lakes, means semiconductor companies can plan for the long term without needing to worry about resource competition now or in the future. Whether it's workforce, infrastructure, power and water, or sustainability investments, the, gov the governor's semiconductor office, GoSemi, is tasked with coordinating government partners in supporting semiconductor companies investing in New York. New York State and our local government partners have also made many strategic investments to create shovel-ready sites built to semiconductor standards, and we're investing more, including $200 million through a program known as Fast New York, a program designed to ensure that we have a variety of shovel-ready sites across the state, not only for manufacturers, but also for supply chain partners and related companies. Additionally, a key pillar of the state's economic development strategy is placemaking. It's based on a belief that where we invest matters and that our built environment must emphasize creating accessible job centers, sustainable infrastructure, and vibrant livable communities. To this end, ESD has supported capital projects across the state, including investments in Main Street small businesses, arts, culture, and all the amenities that make communities across the street, the state a great place to live, work, and play. We also have great K-12 schools, and New York is a place that opens its arms to immigrants. As I'm sure you all know, Micron announced it's going to be investing $100 billion in central New York over the next 20 years, creating the largest chip fab in the nation with more than 9,000 direct employees. And here's why Micron said they chose central New York for their historic investment. They noted a rich pool of diverse talent encompassing communities underrepresented in technology jobs. They noted that there's much to, to offer future Micron employees, including urban and outdoor lifestyles, affordable cost of living, and leading higher education institutions. They noted partnership opportunities with local K-12 programs, community colleges, and institutions for top engineering and technical talent. They also were attracted to a significant military population, which aligns well with their, their goals for veteran hiring. Availability and access to water and clean, reliable power to achieve their long-term environmental and sustainability goals. They noted a long history of semiconductor development and manufacturing in New York and the opportunity to expand the research in the memory sector. And they also were very attracted to the opportunity to collaborate with the Albany Nanotech and the Air Force Research Lab on their R&D portfolio. This project will change the economic trajectory of upstate New York and is a testament to the power of strong state, federal, local, and local partnerships and the role that state governments can play in coordinating those partnerships. Without strong federal leadership by Senator Schumer, this project doesn't happen in the US. But without Governor Hochul's commitments, this project doesn't happen in the New York. 
And without the investments by Anadine County Executive McMahon, this project doesn't happen in central New York. So in closing, again, thank you, Robert. Thank you, ITIF and my fellow panelists for this important discussion. And I'm glad to be part of it. New York State is ready to continue to drive growth and development of this critical industry. We recognize this historic moment and believe we are well positioned for success. As we move forward into implementation, it's now on us to make sure the benefits of all this investment are felt by those who need it most. And equitable economic growth is our final goal. Grateful for the support and leadership of our federal partners, including the Federal Chips Office, and for groups like ITIF for making this work possible and for convening this important discussion. Success in New York and across the country is critical to American national and economic security. Thanks. Kevin, thank you so much. Uh, you know, again, one, you know, to the extent we are going to succeed in this, it's because there's so much energy at the state level. Um, you know, I, I worked for a governor, ran economic development policy for a while. And, and what, what struck me when I did that and, and interacted with other, other my colleagues around the country, the partisan differences are very small. Uh, you know, you see Republican yeah. governors and economic development uh, folks kind of saying the same thing you're saying, uh, the, the sort of weird divergence between free market libertarianism and, and sort of anti-business progressivism is something you only see in Washington. Uh, it's the passion yeah. in the discussions, particularly with Micron, they, those folks were so excited about bringing manufacturing back to America, bringing semiconductor manufacturing back to the United States. You know, as Americans, they were so excited uh, and it was, it was really heartening and, and a you know, great project to be involved with. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I'm hoping we can get some of that state pragmatism to <laughs> infuse Washington even more. Certainly we did that with the Washington did that with the Ships Act, but we need to we need to keep going. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, now over to Wes. I think, uh, Wes, you're going to kick off next. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rob. And uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks to ITIF for having us today to talk about such an important topic. I thought I'd give a few high level comments on a few items and I'll let my colleague Adriana Cruz talk about them in a little bit more detail. Um, but as Rob mentioned, you know, we view the future of the industry and the success of the CHIPS Act as a state federal partnership in many ways. And we've been working with stakeholders in Texas and our counterparts in Washington uh, towards that goal for many years now. Uh, and in Texas, you know, this has been a priority of Governor Abbott for quite some time. As it relates uh, specifically to the CHIPS Act, the governor made clear his support for the concept when it was first drafted by Senator Cornyn many years ago. And since that time, our office has been active in its passage and implementation. And we really have put an emphasis on over communication uh, from working with our congressional delegation to stakeholders in Texas um, and to having regular conversations with colleagues at the Commerce Department and the CHIPS program office now. Um, almost two years ago, Governor Abbott created the Texas Semiconductors Task Force. And the idea really was to bring together state government the semiconductor industry, higher education institutions, and workforce stakeholders to best position Texas for the future. We specifically wanted the state to be ready for passage of the CHIPS Act and its subsequent implementation. And so for almost two years now, we've been leading regular conversations with these important stakeholders in Texas, and we feel very good about the position of the state as it relates to implementation of the CHIPS Act. In addition to those discussions, we've been in regular communication with our partners at the Commerce Department and the CHIPS Program Office to talk about the whole gamut of areas where state federal partnership will be needed to successfully secure the supply chain. These conversations really started before the CHIPS Act passed and before the CHIPS program office was even created. Uh, and they've been very productive and have helped us to best dovetail our actions in Texas. As it relates to actions in Texas, uh, we've made some real progress this year. Uh, prior to our state legislative session this year, the governor added this item to his proposed budget and recommended that the state funding be made available to leverage the federal funding provided by the CHIPS Act. This included state support for workforce training programs, higher education research, infrastructure improvements, tax incentive, and other funds, uh, among many other items that the legislature worked on. We then worked with the legislature to pass the CHIPS Act earlier this year, and I want to briefly mention a few important items from the legislation. But first, the legislation codified the Texas Task Force and created the Texas Semiconductor Innovation Consortium which will serve as an advisory panel to the governor and the legislature on all things semiconductors. The legislature established the Texas Semiconductor Innovation Fund to provide funds to encourage economic development in the semiconductor industry, and they appropriated almost $700 million as an initial investment in this fund. 
And finally, the legislature appropriated an additional $660 million for R&D centers at the University of Texas at Austin and Texas A&M University. And we're currently working to implement the Texas CHIPS Act as quickly as possible. And we continue to work with our partners at the Department of Commerce and the CHIPS Program Office as they continue to implement the CHIPS Act at a federal level. I know that we're a bit short on time today, so I'll turn it over to Adriana for some further remarks from Texas. Well, thank you, Wes. And uh, first, let me start off by thanking Rob and ITIF for inviting us to participate and to my state economic development leadership colleagues um, from Arizona and New York uh, to hear about their efforts. And um, Wes gave you kind of a high level overview on the activities that we have seen. Um, and just to tell you a little bit about our office, the Texas Economic Development and Tourism Office's role is to enhance economic opportunities for all Texans by coordinating the state's economic development efforts. And we promote Texas across the country and across the world as a premier business and travel destination. We are very fortunate to have Governor Abbott as our uh, salesman in chief um, who works with us and works with companies, um, as Wes was mentioning, as well as with our state leadership to ensure that we have the economic development tools that we need so that we can be successful. Um, in Texas, we have a long history of leadership in the tech sector and one that has given the state a great reputation in terms of semiconductor uh, manufacturing and innovation. Uh, we are leading the nation and the world towards the future of semiconductors. And as the birthplace of the integrated circuit um, invented by Jack Kilby at Dallas-based Texas Instruments, uh, the Lone Star State is now number one in semiconductor manufacturer and home to major operations and corporate facilities for some of the world's largest semiconductor companies. Um, we also, according to uh, reports, are leading the nation with the largest theoretical wafer capacity, representing about 36% of the total US uh, theoretical manufacturing capacity. We have a workforce, a very robust workforce of 43,000 working in the semiconductor industry. And uh, we're very proud of the Made in Texas brand uh, the Lone Star State has led the nation for the past 12 years in terms of semiconductor exports. Um, today, we have about 15 and growing semiconductor related manufacturing, uh, component manufacturing facilities across the state. And these facilities are supported by a robust network of R&D, chip design, intellectual property, and software providers and semiconductor equipment um, suppliers. And of course, uh, some of these names I've already mentioned, Texas Instruments, uh, but you also have um, Samsung, which had a recent announcement. Uh, they're uh, continuing to grow and expand in Texas uh, with their $17 billion expansion in Taylor, Texas. Um, Infineon, AMD, uh, Intel, NXP, Tower Semiconductor, um, Coherent, um, many other uh, companies operating um, in the state of Texas. Um, some of the things that uh, we have uh, taken on, as Wes mentioned, uh, in October 2021, Governor Abbott announced the formation of the National Semiconductor Center's Texas Task Force. Um, and in Texas, we do things differently. Um, Rob, you mentioned uh, the size and breadth of the nation and so uh, the need for the federal government to partner with states. Texas does things differently as well. We're too big and too diverse of a state uh, to take a top-down approach. And so we work very collaboratively with our regional and local economic development organizations, with our higher education institutions, and with the private sector. And this Texas task force uh, formation is really a, a prime example of that. We brought together our higher education institutions, our regional economic development organizations, the private sector, industry associations, um, and had everyone sort of working together to identify the state's assets and to help us to prepare for when the CHIPS uh, program, the, the, the CHIPS Act would be passed and funded. Um, we are so incredibly honored that our Texas delegation um, Senator Cornyn, Congressman McCall, um, where we're authors and we're really a part of the driving force um, on the federal side. Um, and this task force was really 
uh, preparing to coordinate for the development of the proposal to the US Department of Commerce and to the CHIPS program office with the intention to ensure that the Lone Star State um, is the future site of some of the exciting new R&D facilities that will be funded uh, by the CHIPS Act. And really bringing together this private sector, higher education to collaborate together on these generational opportunities uh, that are being presented at this time. Um, going a step further, uh, our state legislature passed the Texas CHIPS Act, uh, which was signed by Governor Abbott um, this June. And, and this codifies the Texas Task Force, but also does a couple of very important things as well. Um, it creates the, um, the Texas Semiconductor Innovation Consortium, uh, which will be uh, made up of 19 uh, higher education institutions, including our community college uh, systems and our Texas State Technical College uh, uh, system. And really the, the purpose is to not only ensure that we're attracting investment uh, to the state and attracting uh, manufacturing and R&D to the state, but also to look to the future and to ensure that we have a strategic plan, that we understand what the needs of the industry are and that we are preparing uh, for the needs of the industry. Um, the, uh, in addition, the Texas CHIPS Act created uh, the um, Texas Semiconductor Innovation Fund. Uh, this is a very important fund, an additional tool in our economic development toolbox uh, to provide matching funds for state entities and higher education uh, for semiconductor manufacturing. And we received an appropriation of almost $700 million uh, for the Semiconductor Innovation Fund. And then an additional 660 million were appropriated to UT Austin for their Texas Institute for Electronics and Texas A&M for the Semiconductor Institute. And um, so this is a very exciting time in Texas. Uh, lots of state programs have been developed to support uh, the federal programs. Um, and we are very honored to be here, Rob, and to be able to share this information with your audience. So thank you, Adriana. You, you know, people in Texas, uh, there, there is, you know, a lot of Texas pride going, going way, way back. And, and not only is Texas big geographically, which I learned one time driving from Florida to California, and I think it was four days to get through Texas. Um, yeah. But actually, if, uh, if Texas were its own country, uh, it would be the 10th largest country in the world in terms of GDP. I'm going to so. correct you on that. Actually, okay. uh, the estimates right now show that we are the eighth largest economy in the world. I stand corrected. Thank you. I must <laughs> have been no, looking at it. Well, Rob, there's another saying we have in Texas. Um, it ain't bragging if it's true. So <laughs> Texans are known for being proud and boastful, um, but it ain't bragging if it's true. So in this case, it is uh, all hat and all cattle. Correct. You are so. correct. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank you. So, by the way, for folks who want to uh, submit questions online, um, you can uh, go to the web, uh, the, uh, the event page, and there's a link uh, on the Slido uh, thing to submit questions, or you can go to the YouTube page as well that's uh, showing now. Um, so, we've had really three great pr uh, presentations uh, uh, from the states, and, and now I want to turn it over to a view from industry. So, David Isaacs from SIA. David, over to you. Great. Well, thanks, Rob and ITIF, and, and thanks to the other panelists. I'm, I'm honored to be here with the states that really are leading the way. And, and I should just uh, add as an aside that um, these states led the way in getting the CHIPS Act passed through Congress. The, the governors played a, a major role in advocacy, along with literally dozens of other uh, governors. Um, the state attorneys generals weighed in as well as did many mayors and the U.S. Conference of Mayors. And, and from my perspective, that kind of a coalition of state and local advocacy, along with industry and, and labor and others, um, uh, helped uh, get the legislation over the goal line. And of course, as be, has been mentioned, um, the congressional delegation from these states were in a leadership role and and were instrumental in, in getting the, the legislation passed. So um, 
I think um, each of the state panelists uh, um, covered many of the points I'm hoping to raise here um, and um, wanted to offer an industry perspective. And, and you know, I, I think as Rob has alluded, um, the states are critical here to the success of the CHIPS Act. Uh, it was the legislation was always contemplated as a federal state partnership. And um, perhaps the most prominent example is that uh, a covered incentive is a requirement of, the, of uh, securing a grant and uh, to ensure that the project has the support of the state and uh, local governments. And um, that covered incentive is, uh, um, well, so if you can go to the next slide, um, I think we're starting to see uh, across the entire nation um, projects that have been announced. And um, hopefully there'll be more uh, uh, shortly. Um, the CHIPS office has announced over um, 400 uh, applications. And um, so I think once the money starts to flow, we'll see more projects announced. But so far there's over 200 billion in private sector investments um, across the full spectrum of, of, of chip fabs, um, equipment facilities, materials facilities, um, covering the entire um, spectrum of, of um, semiconductor segments, uh, advanced logic, uh, analog, memory, legacy chips, you name it. And um, I don't think we've had any packaging announcements just uh, to date, but um, hopefully we'll see that in the near future. But um, I think uh, it's covered 22 states so far, and uh, I'm hoping that we'll see more. Um, so how can the states play a role? So, you know, as I mentioned before, uh, a covered incentive is a, a uh, a requirement of a CHIPS grant. And um, I think that was a recognition that that the, the federal incentive um, in and of itself is insufficient to level the playing field and close the cost gap. And um, you've heard from several of the panelists that these states and others have stepped up in a major way with um, state legislation and programs to um, help incentivize the industry and attract it to their states. And those covered incentives are broadly defined to include um, direct incentives, tax credits, um, workforce development programs, and others. And, and I think the states are employing a diversity of approaches, and I, I think that's worked well so far. Um, another important thing is um, the CHIPS office has emphasized the need for, for clusters and, and partnerships, and we're seeing that emerge. Um, I, I think the states, uh, as several of the panelists have mentioned, um, are playing an important role in facilitating those partnerships and and uh, connecting companies with universities and and local businesses and government agencies and other stakeholders, and that's very important here as well. Um, a couple of uh, the panelists have, have mentioned workforce, and that's obviously a critical issue for the uh, success of the CHIPS Act and the industry as a whole. And, and um, I think the states are, are playing a leading role in that area. Um, if you can go to the next slide, um, SIA recently issued a report um, that tries to assess the, the gap and tries to quantify the gap uh, through the end of the decade in um, skilled workers in our industry. And this is a busy slide. Um, all the materials are on our website. But um, the, the first chart in the upper right corner shows the um, economy-wide workforce gap. So um, in short, um, there's, there's a huge gap um, throughout the economy in skilled workers. And if you look at the lower right corner, um, the, the semiconductor industry's gap is just a small slice of that overall pie. But um, so we don't think we're going to solve this problem uh, solely for the semiconductor industry because a lot of those um, missing workers and, and skills are found in other um, strategic industries, whether it's clean energy or autonomous and electric vehicles and AI and the like. But um, our report found that 
approximately 58% of the jobs to be added in the, in the um, coming years um, are at risk of being unfilled. And that includes um, engineers and uh, computer scientists as well as technicians. And um, so I think we need to see federal state uh, partnerships with industry and, and educational institutions to train these workers. And I think you've heard of um, the work being done at the state level to address that. Um, uh, the need for um, leveraging our veterans who have many of the re requisite skills, I think that's very important. And we need to, um, we need to make sure that continues. Um, I guess two other things I'd like to briefly mention um, in, in closing is um, regulatory approvals. Um, I think the states can play a, a very important role in expediting the, the progress of these projects by ensuring that they move forward seamlessly and, and, and promptly. Um, there's federal legislation to address uh, review under NEPA. Um, that's been passed um, uh, uh, earlier this year, but also uh, in the current defense bill. And we're hoping that will move forward. But the states can play an important role on permitting and other, other regulatory approvals. So let me, let me end there and just say um, the federal, state, and industry partnership is crucial to the success of the CHIPS Act. And um, we look forward to working with the, the states on the line and others in, in seeing this through. So thank you, Rob, and I'll hand it back to you. Yeah, David, thank you so much. You know, one point I think that is people who haven't really followed the legislation or the program, I think, make uh, a miss. Uh, there was a recent article that I thought in a journal that talked about why we need you know lots and lots of audits and all this stuff is it'd be one thing if the if the states and the federal government were funding 60 70 80 90 percent of capex like they do in china uh that's where you need a lot of accountability but can you just say quickly what do you think how much how much of the money on all this is, is industry going to have to be putting up as opposed to the government uh, as far as the state local and federal governments and just as a general rule do you think well, I think it will, it, it will um, depend uh, on the on the nature of the project. Some of the very large capital intensive projects um, that that receive very substantial um, uh, incentives abroad will receive more than other other projects. Um, I think one thing that has not been mentioned so far is the um, advanced manufacturing investment credit under the CHIPS Act as well, which will provide a very significant incentive. And um, that is a, a, in addition to and, and separate from the uh, uh, federal and state incentives. But, um, you know, there is a risk of taking the reporting and record keeping and auditing requirements uh, a bit too far. And we're we're hoping that um, those administrative burdens can, which are absolutely necessary, but we're hoping they can be kept to a minimum to ensure the efficiency of the overall program. Yeah, if you're a company and you're putting in a significant amount of your own money, unless you have the stupidest CEO in the world, um, you're gonna do it right. And I think that's what we have to remember. Uh, there's a lot of at stake for these companies. They're, they're making taking very big risks. These are primarily uh, uh, private sector investments that are being supplemented by federal and, and state incentives, that, which are important. Um, but um, these companies have been doing this for decades. They know what they are doing. Um, they're, they're driven by a globally competitive marketplace. They'll, they'll get it done right. Great. Thank you, David. Uh, Rachel, <clears throat> uh, last but not least, uh, your uh, uh, and the CHIPS program office, the center of all of this. Uh, I used to work at NIST uh, in Gaithersburg. Fantastic. I have great love for NIST. I enjoyed working there and it's such a great organization. And it's just like super professional, super technical and confident. So it's the best place to run this program out of. So Rachel, over to you. Talk maybe a little bit about your thoughts on the state role. Thanks so much, Rob, and uh, thanks to IPIF for hosting this conversation. Um, lucky to be a part of NIST. It's a great team and a great, um, a great community we've built that's working hard every day to implement this program. Um, so you can go to the next slide. Uh, 
I think we have a knowledgeable audience today, but I thought I would start just by briefly um, revisiting the overall vision of the CHIPS program. Uh, and then I'm excited to dive in on the important role for federal state partnerships. So um, there are three major policy reasons for CHIPS for America, economic security, national security, and future innovation. Um, we need to establish CHIPS production here at home to protect our economic and national security against disruptions outside of our control. And um, our, our ability to continue to innovate and lead the way on future innovations uh, really depends on, on new ways of making chips. So, uh, you know, currently the U.S. produces very few of the world's most advanced chips. Um, and, and through Chips for America, we aspire to make the United States a global leader in leading edge chip production. Next slide, please. So the CHIPS Act also recognizes, though, that we need to develop the technical expertise, capabilities, and workforce that will ensure U.S. leadership in semiconductors uh, for many years to come. So when the act was signed into law last summer, um, Congress created two separate efforts to restore U.S. leadership in semiconductors um, that commerce is implementing. Uh, the, the $39 billion uh, manufacturing incentives program, which I think most of the comments here today have referenced, um, but we're also leading an $11 million program to grow the microelectronics and semiconductor R&D ecosystem. Um, and the, these two efforts, the manufacturing and R&D programs, will really inform each other with outputs from the R&D programs um, benefiting U.S. semiconductor manufacturing and vice versa. Uh, as briefly referenced earlier, um, these initiatives, in addition to working alongside state programs, are also working um, with other federal agencies, including Treasury's Advanced Manufacturing Tax Credit, um, the Department of Defense's um, uh, $2 billion Ships for America Defense Funds of the Department of State, um, the National Science Foundation uh, has a Chips for America Workforce and Education Fund, uh, all working closely together. Next slide, please. Thus far, um, here at the Chips Program Office, we've made two announcements related to funding opportunities um, through the $39 billion Manufacturing Incentive Program. Um, the first funding opportunity is geared towards chip makers, specifically the commercial leading edge, current and mature node, and back-end fabrication facilities. Um, the second is for larger supply chain projects, over $300 million in capital investments. Um, later this year, Commerce plans to release um, another funding opportunity uh, focused on projects under $300 million for material suppliers and equipment manufacturers, um, and also an opportunity to support the construction of semiconductor R&D facilities that will further strengthen the ecosystem here in the United States. Next slide. Um, just a few words now about um, our program priorities. The architects of the CHIPS legislation, they really recognize that we have a historic opportunity here to create a robust um, manufacturing and research and development ecosystem that will result in training, education, good jobs, um, and strong communities, as well as U.S. technological leadership in a sector that enables pretty much all others, including national defense. Um, we have six key priority areas that are guiding our approach. Uh, economic and national security, this is the primary lens um, we're bringing to, to evaluate applications. We seek to invest in projects that meaningfully increase U.S. semiconductor production and strengthen U.S. supply chains, um, with a particular emphasis on projects that will mitigate risks from supply chain shocks associated with the geographic concentration of current semiconductor production. Uh, commercial viability, Financial strength, which um, as referenced earlier, means we are catalyzing private investment, not replacing it. Um, and we're asking applicants to structure the finances of their project in ways that maximize um, that private sector contribution and minimizes the need for government incentives. Uh, project technical feasibility and readiness, um, workforce, including plans to develop both the construction and facilities workforces to um, staff these facilities and broader impacts, which means how projects will make a difference in areas like research and development, um, opportunities for diverse and small businesses, environmental stewardship, and community vitality. Uh, the CHIPS legislation uh, requires that applicants make commitments to community investment, um, investments that will build strong communities that actually that support regional economic clusters and drive broad-based growth. Um, and against, again, across all these priorities, we are laying the foundation for American businesses to do what they do best, which is innovate, scale, and compete. Next slide. So just a few words on, on the really the critical nature of this federal, state, um, and local partnership. 
Um, both the incentives program and the R&D effort have released vision papers that outline our strategic objectives. And what you'll see in those papers is that they really emphasize, um, as David mentioned, the, the critical importance of regional clusters or uh, geographically bounded areas with multiple commercial scale fabs, a large and skilled workforce, nearby suppliers, R&D facilities, utilities, and specialized infrastructure. In the first vision paper, um, which is focused on the commercial fabrication facilities, uh, we lay out a vision that by the end of the decade, the United States will have at least two new large scale clusters of leading edge logic fabs, and that each of these chips funded clusters will have the scale, infrastructure, and other competitive advantages required to ensure that chip makers view uh, continued expansion of their presence in the United States as both rational and advantageous. And that's even in the absence of further funding from the CHIPS program office. Um, this includes an ecosystem of the critical uh, onshore suppliers that will be required for, for these projects to be successful. Uh, next slide, please. Um, you'll also see in the vision for success for semiconductor materials and manufacturing facilities, um, a, a, another really strong place-based approach. We state that supporting vibrant U.S. fab clusters is one of the three primary goals by the end of the decade. Um, so each um, chips funded fab cluster in the U.S. Is, is going to be supported by dozens of suppliers, uh, including many that will be investing in the United States for the first time to close critical gaps in the U.S. supplier ecosystem. Um, and as part of these efforts, the CHIPS program office is encouraging state and local entities to facilitate the expansion of these ecosystems and to support both domestic suppliers growing their U.S. presence uh, and non-U.S. suppliers expanding in the United States for the first time. Next slide, please. Um, finally, a, a few words on the state and local incentives that were referenced earlier. Um, as, as David mentioned, these are required under the legislation and they're included in our notice of funding opportunity. Uh, the extent and nature of support from state and local governments is part of the evaluation of a project's financial strength. Um, this includes a strong focus on whether state and local incentives and investments are designed to create spillover effects that benefit a wide set of stakeholders and improve the region's economic resilience. Uh, we state in our funding opportunity that um, the department will generally favor applications that propose projects with sufficient scale to attract the related investments and suppliers and workforces um, that are going to be needed to engender a productive, efficient, and self-sustaining ecosystem. Um, we also say that the department is encouraging state and local incentives that support a robust uh, semiconductor ecosystem beyond assisting a single company. So these can include um, investments in workforce and education, as we've heard about, site preparation, um, infrastructure, including transit or utilities, um, and again, that benefit both the applicant and the broader community. Uh, and we've stated that the department will plus, place less weight on incentives such as direct tax investments um, with less potential for spillover effects. Um, we believe that these targeted investments to realize these um, strategic objectives will uh, capitalize on U.S. Uh, existing strengths in this critically important industry. Um, I think you've, the, the efforts you've heard about today are, are good evidence for the catalytic effect that the CHIPS Act has already had at the state level. Um, we have seen many states, including others not present today, pass legislation to further support the goals of CHIPS for America. Uh, and throughout this process, we have engaged deeply with state partners, um, alongside other community partners, um, really uh, in a, on a strong and continued basis, because we know that they will be so critical um, for the success of the efforts here at Chips for America. Um, these engagements have included roundtables and listening tours, active dialogue, uh, and we're, we're really looking forward to continuing that partnership. So. Um, thank you uh, to ITIF for hosting this today. Um, I'm looking forward to the conversation and to hearing more from my colleagues about their efforts. Great, thank you so much, Rachel. Um, I don't envy you uh, with <clears throat> all the tasks that you have to do to make this program, uh, to, to, to keep it moving along and, 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 and get the projects funded that need, need critical funding. So, um, so let me ask all the panelists, um, maybe a couple of questions before we uh, uh, turn over to the audience questions, which again, feel free to submit those. Um, one, one question is, um, and I guess um, 
Uh, we heard a little bit about this from Adriana. We've been talking about states, uh, but clearly in every state, uh, local governments and county governments uh, play an important role, uh, both in terms of permitting, in terms of their own uh, tax systems, in terms of, uh, in terms of workforce, uh, even incentives. Um, Maybe I'll start with you, Adriana, because you, you you brought it up. But I just I'd love to hear from all, all three states on this. How are you working with local governments? Um, are they enthusiastic? What what role do you see them playing in making the program a success? Uh, the local governments, the regional economic development organizations, are incredibly enthusiastic. They're very excited about this opportunity. Um, Texas is a very big, a very diverse state. And so the ability to utilize um, the federal program, the state program to really help spread the advanced manufacturing sector and semiconductor manufacturing and suppliers across the state of Texas to these diverse communities um, is something that you know everybody's really excited about. Um, we of course need to make sure that they have the infrastructure needed to support that. Um, Governor Abbott and TxDOT recently announced a historic $142 billion um, infrastructure spend over the next uh, 10 years. Um, and, and so, you know, what we're hearing from them is, is they're very excited about the opportunity. Um, Texas takes a very decentralized approach to economic development. And so the local regional groups are working with their universities, with their community colleges to make sure that they've got the programs needed for the projects that we're hoping to attract to the state. I remember, uh, it must've been just 15, 20 years ago, but I was always, I was very impressed with a partnership in Austin where um, uh, they worked with Texas Instruments and it wasn't just about incentives, it was really about expanding the, 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 the uh, UT and semiconductor engineering program. And that was a pretty important incentive, if you will, mm -hmm. just making sure that the universities are aligned so that I think is one of the things that you're alluding to there, how local governments can play a key role. That's uh, absolutely right. Yeah. Great, thank you. Kevin, over to you. Hey, thanks, Rob. <clears throat> yeah, I think as Adriana said, you know, New York's also large state and the regions are different. Every region's different from the other. So working with our local partners is critical. They know their regions best. They have the best, they got their fingers on the pulse. Um, you know, we do make investments in support of, of their investments. So how do they do the infrastructure? How do they do the site development? How can we help them do that? But, it, you know, they are the ones who've assembled the parcels, right? They put together these sites. Uh, and as I said in my, my opening remarks, you know, the Micron project doesn't happen without that regional partner, right? That the, the county executive from Onondaga County was, you know, excited, aggressive, thoughtful, you know, made the investments, took the risks to make those investments. You never know whether you're whether you're going to be successful, and that's a that's a hard political place to be sometimes. Um, but he took those risks, and so our partners are critical. New York also has we call it the Regional Economic Development Council. So each region brings together academic and industry partners along with community stakeholders to develop a strategic plan, emphasis, you know, it's strengths, the SWOT analysis, right? What do you got? What do you need? Where you want to go? They come up with a plan. And so New York supports those, those plans and, and those investments. And so, yeah, as with Texas, everybody's excited, right? This is incredible opportunity, right? As, as, as New Yorkers, as Americans, you, where else would you want to be than right here, right now, trying to bring this industry back to, the US, right? And so really exciting time. Our locals are excited, our feds are excited. Everybody's uh, really supporting and working hard to make sure make sure we succeed here. Great, Kevin, thank you. Uh, over to you, Sandra. Uh, you're, you're not as big, but you do have a bunch of different metropolitan areas and, and they play different roles, so. Absolutely, and thank you. Just like my colleagues have described the importance of collaboration and teamwork and creating a united vision, but ultimately bringing every single partner available uh, is necessary. Um, as Rachel mentioned, this works uh, when we're all working together. So the federal partners along with the state and our regional and local partners, no one organization can do it alone. And this, um, th this vision that uh, Rachel laid out is something we can all support. So not only are we working very closely with our universities, our community colleges, 
every workforce development partner we've got in our state has come to the table to help um, address some of the issues, obviously, that David pointed out. Talent is an area of focus for all of us. In addition to, obviously, infrastructure, our cities are doing amazing work. Again, expediting that permitting process to make sure that we can meet the timelines of industry so everyone is pulling together to, to ensure that not only are we successful here in Arizona, but ultimately we are successful as a country. And I would also mention that the work, obviously, that Adriana and the, the team in Texas and then Kevin and the team in New York are doing are so critical to advancing the competitiveness of the U.S., just as the work we're doing here in Arizona and those states that aren't um, necessarily here today, but are also very important partners. We, um, we often, people think states compete against each other, but often we are working together, uh, building up a uh, competitiveness strategy that will support the U.S.'s goals at the federal level. So we do a lot of work together and uh, cross state lines to help support each other. Um Yes, I think we could call that system a co-opetition system. You both compete and cooperate, at least that's what I've seen. Um, I want to, one, one last question before I, I, I go to the audience questions, which is one of the things about, that I think why locals are important here is a lot of the regulatory decisions are made at the local level, but there are also national regulations or state regulations. You know, we created our, if you will, regulatory systems for business investment and, and plant and equipment of all you know, we created it really at a time when we weren't facing any serious global competition. And, and, and we've got to, I think, completely revisit that because other countries and it's not are, are, are doing better. And it's not like there there are some countries that just have no regulations. And obviously that's a terrible thing. But it's more that other countries are, are streamlining it. They're they're making it easy to do it without, you know, some places are doing it rather than sequentially. They're doing it in parallel. So things get done quickly. Can you just say quickly? <laughs> also, what 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 is each of your states doing uh, in, in regard to that, um, Kevin? Maybe I'll uh, turn it over to you to start with sort of that, this whole question about regulatory uh, com uh, compliance, but also ease. Yeah, uh, thanks, Rob. Uh, clearly, we, it, it's work that uh, we need to, as a nation, improve on. But in New York as well, um, as I mentioned, the governor created an office, we, we call it GoSemi. It's a lot of words, but it's a cute acronym. Um, and our goal is to support the companies the, in the industry, their success. And part of that will absolutely be thinking about how do we permit quickly? How do we facilitate? You know, one of the things we're hearing a lot about, if you're going to have companies coming from Taiwan as part of the supply chain or Japan, how do we facilitate their work in, in, in New York and in the US, how do we do that as seamlessly as possible while still you know, maintaining environmental standards and workforce standards, um, but we can do it. Uh, and so I think some ways it's just effective communication, simplifying, streamlining uh, is, is really critical, but, but the work of the, Go, the governor's Go Semi office will absolutely include thinking about how we can make sure we're facilitating, you know, shovels in the ground and completion of the construction of the projects. Hey, thank you. Adriana, how are you thinking uh, about that? Yeah, that, that is a very, very important um, aspect. And I think something that's a point of pride for Texas. Um, we are known for being very, very business friendly and having a reasonable regulatory environment. Um, CEO Magazine has ranked us as the best state for business for 18 years in a row. And Governor Abbott always says, you know, that the state operates at the speed of business. And so we think that we are a partner in these companies as they are looking to establish operations in the state uh, with the company, with the local government. Some permits, of course, come through the locals, but the ones that are at the state level, in particular, the Texas Commission for Environmental Quality, for instance, they're one of our state agency partners that we meet with on a monthly basis and we talk about economic development projects with them so that they're prepared uh, when that um, semiconductor company or manufacturer comes and says, we need a, a permit. Um, and of course, you know, time is always uh, a, a compelling factor with a lot of um, uh, private sector decisions. And so we see ourselves as a, as a partner 
um, to help them get that, that permit as, as quickly and efficiently as possible. Um, and that, that is something that's very important as they're making this decision. Great, thank you. Uh, Sandra? Yeah, so well, similar to uh, the other states, we also pride ourselves in um, our regulatory environment. We are used to seeing very substantial, large manufacturing projects here in Arizona. We're able to get shovels in the ground quickly. Our local communities have created programs to really expedite that permitting process. So when we work with local communities, they have uh, been extremely successful in making sure that our companies are getting their permits quickly. We also, as you mentioned, there's lots of regulatory agencies. There's some at the local level, then there's at a county uh, level, and then at the state and then federal level. So our job is to make sure that we're helping our businesses navigate through all of those various approval processes from a regulatory environment. We do that very closely, obviously, with our partners. Uh, one important partner for us here in Arizona is the Arizona Chamber of Commerce, and they have been very instrumental in, uh, in staying ahead of that federal regulations and, and um, some of the areas in which perhaps we can see some level of improvement as we move forward. Again, we're always looking at ways to improve, ways to expedite. Time is money, as you can imagine, and these companies want to get up and running as quickly as possible. So very similar to what the other states are doing, we are constantly having conversations about the regulatory environment and how to make that easier on industry. Great, thank you. Uh, Rachel, is that something that you're looking at as you as you manage this entire program, sort of how well states and, 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 and then locals, counties are, are working on this issue? Yeah, it's, it's mentioned in our um, in our funding and uh, opportunities that um, permitting is a, a factor that um, can be part of the state and local incentive um, is in, in terms of facilitating effective permitting. Um, we have built an experienced team here at the CHIPS program office that is uh, going to work hand in hand with state and local officials, uh, officials in terms of uh, ensuring that those matters are handled with um, the the dedication and care and expertise that is needed. Um, you'll also see in our, our latest um, vision for success around small suppliers that we are um, also dedicating staff here towards the support of cluster efforts more broadly um, in, turning, in terms of the types of um, services um, uh, and uh, infrastructure that's going to be needed to really ensure that these um, clusters are productive, self-sustaining, uh, well-functioning ecosystems. And um, as we move into the implementation phase, we'll be looking forward to working closely in, in partnership with the state and local entities on the ground to make that possible. Great, thank you. David, any thoughts on that? I know it's pretty, uh, you mentioned it already in your remarks, but any thoughts uh, after hearing uh, from the states and Rachel? Yeah, well, I mean, obviously um, the, the regulatory process is important to meet a number of societal and environmental goals. And, and I think the uh, applicants for, for the, the, under this program respect that. Um, but I, I guess what we don't want it to do is cause undue delay. We, um, we, many of these projects are already in progress. Uh, we want to see them um, quickly move to completion and become operational so that we can get the, the economic supply chain, national security benefits that is the, the fundamental goal of the CHIPS Act. So I think it's a matter of ensuring that we have a streamlined and effective process. And as we're hearing from the states on the line, I think that's uh, well underway. Thank you. So a question which I'm going to broaden slightly is, uh, the questioner points out that a number of states have made um, some investments on their own, you know, pre pre chips um, passage, and also companies have made investments, and um, it suggests, you know, why are we helping states and companies that have already made investments? Shouldn't we be working on the, the marginal cases that haven't? I don't think that's a good thing. I think we should be rewarding states and companies that have already made investments because they took big risks. I think we should be neutral with regard to past behavior. But um, that is something I guess some people could say, hey, uh, New York or 
Texas or Arizona. You guys already spent money. Uh, you're good to go. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll give the money to somebody else or, uh, hey, Intel or TSMC or whoever uh, applied. Uh, you've done this, too. We'll, we'll do something else. Uh, thoughts on that? Uh, anybody want to go first on that one? Well, I'll jump in with one comment, yeah. Rob, and, and that is um, I think many of the investments we've seen, certainly from the companies, uh, perhaps at the state level as well, has been done in expectation of of the the chips act um recognizing those efforts and and um i think that's a reasonable expectation and i think the the projects that you've seen um announced um many of them i'm assuming are applying for funds we, we don't know that for a fact but um those are the very types of projects we need to build up the supply chain and develop the critical mass we need for for the industry to thrive and and renew itself here in, in the U.S. Great. Yeah. Go ahead. I, I would I would agree with David. It's and certainly we've heard it from our colleagues in the chips office. Critical mass. Mm -hmm. Well, it's critical. Uh, so continued investment. Uh, piggybacking on the work we're doing um, is is what is going to see us succeed. It's you can't spread the investments over the entire nation and expect to see success. You know there has to be strategic cluster based investments. Otherwise, we're not going to succeed. If the peanut butter is spread over the whole sandwich, you won't you won't taste it. And so we've got to continue to support states like Texas and Arizona and New York who have made those investments uh, already and, and, and from a national perspective, continue to capitalize on those investments. And I would just add to that, and I think obviously Kevin and David's comments are right on in that those investments, the discussion around the CHIPS Act was um, happening for at least three years or more. There was um, a lot of industry discussion uh, along with our um, elected leaders across states, as well as at the federal level about this global competitiveness. And if we think about the US and what we collectively are trying to accomplish. It really is about a global competitive industry. And we have to be very strategic about the investments that are made. And we have to ensure that there is a uh, there's leverage opportunities as well. Rob, you pointed out that the investment that the private sector is making is so substantial and David, I think in your presentation, you mentioned $217 billion have already been announced as investments in this industry alone. So the private sector is doing their part. States and the federal government, along with our local partners, universities and others have been galvanized to come together to ensure that we are competing at a global and not uh, a global level. So I think we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that this is a global competition and that we are working together as states and at the federal level to compete. Um, in, and so the critical nature of creating those clusters is going to be absolutely necessary for us to compete on a global stage. Yeah. And to, to follow up on, on Sandra's point, and, and I'm trying to remember, you know, for, for those of us that have been recruiting in the semiconductor industry for a long time, we know that there is a cost differential of 30% on investing in Asia versus investing in the United States. And so to have the federal government as a partner, because the states and, and local, I've, I've done it at the state level, I've done it at the local level, um, and we have been trying to sort of do it you know, on our own um, for a long time. And so to have the federal government now come in as a partner, that is a generational uh, opportunity and 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 really something that can be transformational to many of our communities. Um, so the idea of having these hubs and these clusters is really important. In the end, the the nation is going to win, and the entire United States is going to win uh, by the growth of this very critical um, sector and bringing it back to the United States. And uh, Rob, if I could just jump in with two sure. different points real quickly. Yep. Um, you know, number one is over the past several years, our 
our competitors in, in Europe and Asia were moving forward with, with their own incentive programs. Um, so so uh, the global competition continues. And then secondly, um, there's just a few years ago, we were facing a, a historic chip shortage. Um, demand for semiconductors is growing. So investment decisions need to be made now uh, but before the, the, the money is, is rolling out. And these projects can take a couple of years to build. And, and therefore, um, I don't think companies or states should be penalized for stepping up and being the first mover. Great. Thank you. And also, Adriana, to your point about the cost gap, um, I don't know if, if it's, uh, I know Stephen Azell on our team who leads our semiconductor work has written about this. A lot of that cost, even those countries are stepping up with their own, if you will, chips program. A lot of that cost gap was from their prior incentives. Okay. So this has been going on for 30, 40 years where our countries are competing and are willing to put big incentives on the table and companies are rational and they'll choose that. So if we're going to win this industry, we've got to respond uh, in kind. There's a question. It relates to talent. Um, and it says uh, in its Arizona project, uh, TSMC has talked about uh, the issues of, of engineering talent in, in, in Taiwan and how good it is and, and, and perhaps some questions here. It's to, I'd just be curious what people's thoughts are on that, but also um, one of the keys of that, their engineering talent is good because they have a lot of firms, strong firms like TSMC and others. And the reason they have strong firms is their engineering talent's good. And it just is this mutual cumulative causation, as economists would say. So a little bit, little, a lot of that's chicken or egg. We, we could have great engineering talent or more of it if, we, if the engineers knew there were going to be jobs, which now they do. And so I think we should have a little bit of patience on this question. But um, Sandra, maybe I'll, because it was related to Arizona, I'll let, have you jump in if you would. Absolutely. Thank you, Rob. And I, um, you know, when it comes to talent, um, it, it is a discussion that we're having, every other state is having, every country is having the talent shortage in this industry and in advanced manufacturing across the board is a global challenge. And um, every every country, as you know, the U.S. And, and others are talking about how do you shift the um, the opportunities for that the future of work. What's happening, and we talk about engineering, but it's across the board, right? Engineering technicians, operators, the advanced manufacturing sector. We're seeing tremendous growth here in the U.S. It is not a specific issue to any one state. It really is across the industry. And how do we start to think about upskilling and retraining um, our workforce and the new generation of workers coming through the educational system to ensure that they have the skills necessary to meet sort of that, that future need? Here in Arizona, what we're doing is working obviously very closely with industry. We're bringing industry to the table to understand what their future needs are. We've developed a, uh, a partnership with our community colleges and our universities to ensure that we're meeting those needs. As I said earlier, ASU is now considered the largest engineering, has, has the largest engineering school in the country. It enrolled over 30,000 engineers, student, engineering students just this year. We've seen a tremendous growth that was 160% growth. The kind of activity that we're seeing here in Arizona, and I'm sure my colleagues can speak to the activity that they're doing, we're all focused on this. But again, it is something that we do in cooperation, in partnership with industry. If we're training individuals in a system that isn't producing the um, the talent necessary to meet future demand, then we haven't solved the problem. So it's really important to bring industry to the table, to have those conversations, to understand where the gaps are. And it's important to understand this is a global issue. We're starting to shift, see shifts in the skill sets necessary for that next generation production uh, facility. And it's so important that we are all working very closely together. Talent, as you know, uh, moves where the jobs are or where they want to live. And we're seeing tremendous growth here in Arizona. So we're going to continue to work very closely with TSMC, Intel, all of the other companies in the industry to ensure that they've got the talent they need. Kevin, any thoughts on that? I know you, you're blessed with a really 
you know, very deep and broad diversity of, of, of you know, great research universities, uh, from, all the way from Buffalo to New York and Albany and others. Um, how are you, you, do you agree with that assessment that we have challenges and do you think those, those challenges are meetable? We absolutely have challenges. This is a generational issue. Uh, Adriana said this, is, this has been happening for a generation. Semiconductor manufacturing has been leaving the US for my whole life. And so um, we got to, there is a, I think maybe the, possibly the greatest legacy of the, Sem the CHIPS Act will be as a, as a leveraging force to get us to change the way we're doing things like K-12 education with a stronger focus on STEM, stackable credentials, certificates, you know, allowing the workforce to be much more mobile. Uh, I think in New York, we're seeing, you know, Micron makes a commitment of $100 billion dollars and we know the things that we need to do, but it's a real leveraging force to coalescing people to move in that direction. So as we think about changing the way we do education, as we think about engineering, it's, there's excitement, but there's also it's a real leveraging force to help us move to do the things that we need to do as a, as a state and as a nation. And I think the CHIPS Act, maybe the greatest legacy, if we're lucky, it will be that change in the way we think about STEM and K-12 and, you know, two-year degrees for, you know, all of the workforce. I think that may be, if we're lucky, the greatest outcome of, of the CHIPS Act. Obviously, the investments in the, in, the, in the companies will be amazing. But if we can change the way we do those things, then we will change the way we perform as a country uh, in these spaces. We just, I, I want to ask Adriana that just quickly. We, uh, ITIF issued a report late last year looking at the state of electrical engineering education, which is a component of all this, obviously. And it was quite troubling, actually, uh, in, in terms of how we're graduating double E's, uh, both at the BS level and at the master's level. And I think ultimately it's not just because students don't think their opportunities, the wages are super high. Uh, I think it has to do with the fact that we've got to get more universities engaged and uh, you know, one of the problems with engineering, I think, is they, they a lot of engineering programs intentionally try to make it hard to get kids to drop out, which is just ridiculous. Uh, uh, there have actually been very good studies that show that uh, the, the females who leave, the males who leave are about equal good or bad. The females who leave actually tend to be slightly higher quality in terms of their, their skills. And, and people just get forced out who could stay in. And so that's why I think all, a lot of what you're all doing in terms of getting your engineering schools really committed to this. And, and, and you know, it's hard work. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of times engineering, also the other, I'm on my soapbox, they do all the boring stuff in the first couple of years, the really hard stuff. And then, you know, the kids are like, eh. some schools are really trying to engage the really exciting stuff early on along with the hard stuff so that you can see vision and you have more commitment. In. To do it so there's a lot of really great things happening in that space but we need to do more um adriana uh, last i'll give you the last word here last last few words i'm so i and i'm and, gonna go and quick. rachel, and Sorry, rachel. Um, okay. in texas you can't have economic development without workforce development um bottom line we need to have the workers for the projects that we're attracting to the state we're working very closely with our universities we have um 11 tier one research universities in the state a very robust community college network. And it's not just the engineers uh, that we need, but in the semiconductor industry, you need the two-year technicians. You need the construction labor that are going to build the facilities. And so we're very excited that we've got everything from Samsung partnering with UT Austin to develop that workforce pipeline for them. Uh, we've got Austin Community College and Dallas College working with the semiconductor industry to develop those two-year technician programs. And we have even apprenticeship programs. Taylor, Texas, uh, the, the new home to the Samsung Fabs, uh, just implemented a plumbing apprenticeship program with the U.S. Department of Labor because we're going to need plumbers to build these facilities and the construction workers for that as well. So our community colleges are focused on the technicians, on the construction trades, uh, but then also on the engineers, which is so important. That's great. Thank you. Uh, Rachel, I will give you the second to last word as I before I close. So, 
I know we're just about at time, so I'll be fast. Um, Secretary Raimondo has been really explicit here. This is a priority across both the incentives program and the R&D program. Um, we can't just invest only in buildings and equipment and material if we don't invest in our human capital here in the United States. Our efforts will, will not go nearly as far. And, um, and she's also been very direct that this is going to require a, a whole of society um, uh, call to arms and call to action um, across industry, uh, colleges, government, um, the private sector, uh, nonprofits, community partners, unions. Um, it's really going to require all of us coming together here at the incentives program. As the folks on the screen know well, we have um, a workforce plan as a required component of the application and. Uh, uh, firms can use CHIPS money to support workforce development for facilities and construction. Um, the R&D program has uh, announced um, as part of the National Semiconductor uh, uh, Technology Center um, a, a vision to have a center of excellence that will be focused on workforce development nationally. Um, we're working closely with our federal partners and uh, this is an area that's going to be a huge um, opportunity for state and local collaboration. So I'm glad we're discussing it here. Uh, workforce investments are encouraged as part of that state and local incentive vision. Um, and I, I think that we we have, uh, as Kevin has stated, a, a huge opportunity to set an example with this industry for what this can look like um, when, when when done well. So I'm, I'm actually really excited about the opportunities ahead and um, the efforts that are being put in around the country to make sure that we can truly take advantage of this historic opportunity. Great. Thank you. So I think uh, everybody in the audience, I, th I hope one of the messages you get from this event is uh, just really how pragmatic, forward-looking, innovative, um, focused our state governments are. Uh, we've got three leaders here on semiconductors, but we shouldn't forget there are other industries that other states are also working on, uh, electric vehicles, uh, solar, all sorts of things. Uh, and I, I wrote something a while back, and it was called Why Washington Should Think Like a State. And if I have one wish, it's that we we need to think more like a state and act like a state. And, and what do I mean by that? Putting aside partisan bitterness, putting aside ideologies, you know, Republican governors want their government to do something. Democratic governors make, want to make sure that government has a light touch and enables business development. We really have to start thinking like that uh, in Washington because Washington, the, the country is now a big state. Uh, we didn't compete with other countries 40 or 50 years ago. States have been competing with each other. And as Sandra said, co cooperating and competing with each other. So I hope we can do that. Uh, just for people in the audience, uh, just to let you know that all the slides will be on the, on the web page uh, after the event. So feel free to refer to them there. And uh, I want to thank everybody in the audience for joining us. And I want to especially thank um, uh, all our panelists today, uh, Rachel, for all the great work you're doing in Chip's office, and then uh, Sandra, Wes, uh, Kevin, and Adrian, obviously, for all the efforts you're making in, in your own states, and David for uh, what the industry is doing. So again, thank you, everybody. And uh, we'll keep fingers crossed that this moves forward and we regain global leadership in semi-production. Thank you, everybody. Thank Thanks, you. Rob. Thank, Thank you. you.